Thank you, Frank, and the organizers, Carol, and the others who have organized this second Open End, Open Mind conference uh, here in Skanderborg, and for the possibility to be here with you all tonight. The five years ago, almost today, on September 15th, the greatest crisis in the history of the financial world erupted when the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury arbitrarily bankrupted one of the largest investment banks in the world, Lehman Brothers, deliberately and knowingly to panic the world and to panic the U.S. Congress into giving him, as Treasury Secretary, carte blanche over a a pool of money from the U.S. taxpayers called the Troubled Asset Recovery Program, TARP. The Treasury Secretary at that time was Henry Paulson, who was formerly chairman of Goldman Sachs, and Paulson used that money to save his friends on Wall Street at taxpayer expense. How many of you in this room tonight believe that the activities of the authorities in the U.S. and in the European Union over the past five years have solved the greatest financial crisis in history. If you think it's solved, raise your hands. Oh, <laughs> well, you're right. Back in the 1970s, when he was the most powerful political man in Washington, Henry Kissinger said, something that uh, struck me very much and it became the light motif for a trilogy of books that I've written over the years. He said, if you control oil, you control entire nations. If you control food, and I'll speak on this on Sunday morning, if you control food, you control the people. And if you control money, you control the entire world. Well, the powerful bad people that Henry Kissinger's career has been based on being a servant of, families with known names like Rockefeller, Rothschild, and so forth, and families with pretty much unknown names, but these powerful elite families that see themselves as the gods of money, they have been out to control the world for many, many, many years. I want to go back a little bit in time to the creation of the dollar system, because I think if we understand that, even in rudimentary form, a lot of things begin to make more sense about what's happening in today's world. The end of World War II in, or before the end, but when the end was clear that it would be uh, an allied victory over Nazi Germany with the help of 26 million Russians and Soviet citizens dying in the war. The U.S. President Roosevelt convened a conference in New Hampshire called Bretton Woods, New Hampshire to create a post-war monetary order. Now, many economists, and I I know of no university economist in the West who's worth a dime on a dollar in terms of the theories that they profess, but most economists tell you in the textbooks that the dollar system, post-war system, was created at Bretton Woods. But in my view, it was created on August 9th, 1945, when the U.S. President Harry S. Truman gave the decision to drop the atomic bomb on innocent civilians in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. Not to bring the Japanese to unconditional surrender, but to tell the world, we are the king on this planet, and what we say, everybody must obey. That essentially was the foundation of the dollar gold exchange system that was nominally created at Bretton Woods. The point being, 
that power, raw military power, was and is to this day the foundation of the dollar system. Now, of course, at that time, the United States Federal Reserve, the central bank in America, had more than 60% of the monetary gold of the entire world through the war and through various dislocations. So the dollar was more than backed by gold, and therefore all currencies were pegged to the dollar, and the dollar was exchangeable for gold. Now at that time there was a dollar shortage in Europe because the Europeans needed to borrow dollars to rebuild their economies. The French, the Germans, everybody. The English, the British. So dollars flowed into Europe. U.S. companies, U.S. oil companies, above all through the Marshall Plan, were able to sell their oil to a Europe that was converted from coal onto an oil-based economy. And the system worked fairly well up through the end of the 1950s into the 60s. But by the mid-60s, the economies of Europe, especially Germany, to a less extent France under de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, the economies of Europe were rebuilt with state-of-the-art technologies, whereas the US economy had been rebuilt in the build-up for war at the end of the 1930s into the 1940s. And the US economic base was badly in need of renewal, renovation. So the Europeans began demanding that the Washington devalue the dollar against gold, that it made no sense because the uh, productivity, every other measure you want to take of the value of the European currencies, the German mark, the French franc, and so forth, uh, was much higher than it was in the early 50s when Europe was a field of, of bombed-out rubble. Well, the U.S. government refused adamantly any of the European pleas to bring the monetary system in order. Lyndon Johnson had a guns and butter policy of the war on poverty, which was a war for poverty in reality. That's when I got out of university and went to work idealistically for this. Uh, and at the same time, the buildup, which the Pentagon and the military industry wanted of the Vietnam War, the Southeast Asian War. So the French started taking the dollars that had accumulated for their exchange of goods with the US and began coming to the New York Federal Reserve and said, okay, we want our gold. Well, at the beginning, they got their gold. Until the end of the 60s, the drain on the gold reserves of the Fed became so great that the trading floor of the London Metals Exchange literally broke because of the weight of gold bars that were put on the floor for buying and selling. And there was a devaluation of the pound sterling, which had been closely pegged to the dollar. It was an Anglo-American relationship. And by August 1971, Nixon, as president, was advised by an assistant treasury secretary who came from David Rockefeller's bank, Chase Manhattan Bank, by the name of It's okay? Okay. Uh, by the name of Paul Volcker, Paul Volcker advised Nixon to take the Bretton Woods Treaty, which the Congress had solemnly ratified and was a treaty obligation of the United States government, hold a press conference where he would tear that treaty up in the face of the world and essentially say, go to hell, you can't do anything about it, we no longer give you the gold. So from that point on, the dollar was what they call in, in the financial world a floating currency. The value sank 40% against the German mark within a matter of weeks, a dramatic collapse, until something quite unexpected happened for the Europeans and the rest of the world. In October of 1973, there was a war between Israel and its Arab neighbors called the Yom Kippur War. 
And Henry Kister, as Secretary of State, began his famous shuttle diplomacy where he'd fly to Damascus and Cairo and then back to Tel Aviv and telling one side and the other, lying to both sides. And against the pleas of the King of Saudi Arabia, King Faisal, the US government unilaterally armed Israel with advanced weaponry against the Arab side. And King Faisal said quite openly, well before this uh, war broke out, if you continue to do that, we will have an OPEC oil embargo on the United States and Europe. Well, six months before the Yom Kippur War, there had been a very, very closed door secret meeting in Salt Shubaten outside of Stockholm. at a place called the Grand Hotel, which was owned by the Wallenberg family. And the meeting brought together some 85 of the most powerful men. I don't think there were any women at this particular meeting. Uh, David Rockefeller was there, the chairman of Atlantic Richfield Oil Company, Robert O. Anderson, who created the Aspen Institute, uh, and was also big in the North Sea oil development. Uh, the Rothschilds were there, the heads of British Petroleum, Royal Dutch Shell. At that time it was Exxon and Mobil, two separate companies. All of the major Anglo-American oil company heads were there. And the meeting was held under the auspices of something called the Bilderberg Meeting. Now there's a lot of conspiracy theory and a lot of rubbish about the Bilderberg and so forth, but. I stumbled across a book in a bookstore on the banks of the Seine in Paris back some 30 years ago, and it had very tiny print at the top of this little white pamphlet, said, strictly confidential, not for publication. And then I looked down, of course, I was curious. And I looked down and I saw, Salchubaden, Sweden, May so-and-so, 1973, Bilderberg meeting. I said, oh, okay, let me take this little book and go in and ask him how much he wants for it. He said, 25 cents. Shakespeare Bookstore, if anybody knows. Uh, I said, well, that's a little bit used, but okay. Then he put his stamp on it before I could stop him on the front cover, so Shakespeare and Company Books. So. I got home and opened this thing and I read it and my eyes almost popped out because they had a discussion six months before the Arab oil embargo presented by an American consultant to the US oil companies and he outlined a scenario he said the OPEC countries are about to make an enormous increase in the dollar price of oil traded and you would think that there would be discussion in the, in the uh, meeting of these powerful industrialists and oil people and so forth. Well, what can we do to prevent this, to convince them not to make this enormous? And he gave actual figures. And the figures, if you calculate them out, add up to almost precisely 400% increase of oil prices. Well, in October, as promised, the King Faisal declared an oil embargo. There was a huge jump in the oil price because the market suddenly had no OPEC oil for a period of, of weeks, if not months. There were uh, uh, driverless Sundays in Germany and uh, oil lines uh, all over the United States and so forth to queue up for the scarce gasoline that was available. And then at the December 1973 OPEC meeting, the Shah of Iran, he demanded even a further increase in the oil price against the objections of King Faisal in Saudi Arabia. And years later in 2000, in September 2000, I was invited to London to give a talk at the institute that was set up after he was pushed out of office by the Americans, uh, by uh, the Saudi Arabian oil minister at the time, Sheikh Yamani, Zaki Yamani a fascinating man, a very widely read man, and he invited me to his home afterwards to have a discussion about my book because he'd read the book where I described what 
as best I could what I thought happened in the oil crisis, the oil shock of 1973. He said, Professor Engdahl, I said, excuse me, Your Excellency, but I'm, I'm no professor. He said, Professor Engdahl, <laughs> your book is the only book I've come across that tells what really happened. He said, I was sent by my king to Tehran to ask the Shah, why are you demanding such a sharp increase in OPEC oil prices? Because don't you know that will create an economic recession in the world and demand for our oil will drop? The Shah answered me, he said, tell your king if he wants the answer to his question, he should go to Washington and ask Henry Kissinger. Kissinger was invited to the Bilderberg meeting that I described earlier. Then the dollar went into a phase called the petrodollar, as I call it, the petrodollar era, which lasted up into the 1980s, and to make sure that the most valuable commodity traded internationally would only be sold in dollars because at that time the Germans were desperate to use German marks to pay for oil in return for German machine tools and so forth that Iran and other countries wanted from, from Germany and the French as well, the Japanese as well with yen. Well, Washington made sure that didn't happen. They sent an assistant treasury secretary to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and told the king, we want an agreement with you that you will never allow OPEC to sell oil in any other currency than the US dollar. And in return, we will give you all the military equipment Saudi Arabia needs to protect itself. At the protest of Israel, they did that. Of course, it was outdated equipment and, and whatnot. But since that time, the price of oil has been only denominated in US dollars. Well. That bailed out the dollar. It made the Wall Street banks the richest banks in the world. They were just flooded with money. Their, their London Euro dollar outposts of Chase Manhattan and others. And they recycled, as Kissinger termed it, recycled these petrodollars from the Middle East through London in the form of loans to South American countries like Argentina or Brazil so that they could pay for the 400% increase in their oil imports. So the big oil companies, Anglo-American oil companies, earned on every side of the bargain, and the banks that were tied to them earned on every side of the bargain until the 1980s. Then the US economy started rotting big time. There was a savings and loan crisis by the end of the 80s. Uh, a real estate bubble had built, built up inside America. and real estate oriented banks called savings and loans went through multiple bankruptcies because the government and and uh, the big bank lobby of wall street began to pressure for deregulation of certain rules that had kept a stable real estate lending market in the u.s uh, you know much more about this than i do rosa but uh, at the end of the 80s something happened and that was that the European elites made the judgment that America as the greatest power, the greatest economic power on earth, which had been the case since the end of the war, World War II, that America was really a former superpower, just like England was uh, before 1914. And they said, well, there's gonna be a vacuum and we have to make sure that the Japanese or someone like that don't fill the vacuum. We have to create a United States of Europe and a European Central Bank, a European Monetary Union to go with that United States of Europe so that we can have the same weight on the world stage as the United States has had all these years and that we don't have to bow down as, well, the term that Brzezinski uses, the vassal countries to the American uh, Lord, but that we represent our own interests as an independent force. So they created something that became the European Central Bank and the Euro. Well, the United States elites watched this development and they used one of their own, a hedge fund speculator named George Soros, 
to lead an attack on the British pound sterling, which had decided the British elites in the city of London and the royal family had decided that they were going to break with tradition of centuries and ally themselves with a European entity and not play from outside Europe and manipulate a balance of power, Germany against France or whatnot. They had decided to cast their lot with the emerging euro so that the city of London would dominate this new currency. Well, Washington calculated if London goes into the euro, Wall Street and New York is finished as the financial capital of the world and the power that brings is going to be limited dramatically. So they gave this hedge fund speculator insider information, that's the only way he would have bet billions of dollars like he did, and he won the title, The Man Who Broke the Bank of England. Well, what he did was prevent the British from joining the Euro. So the Euro limply went ahead because the European political elites determined that this had to be done, especially the French and the Italians. Uh, the Germans initially were very, very reluctant, Helmut Kohl, saw this as a containment of the new unified Germany. But then around 1994, Deutsche Bank and several of the big Frankfurt banks met with Kohl and they said, Chancellor Kohl, we have figured out that if we play this euro in the right way, the French banks are, are uh, in deep, deep trouble the British banks are in deep, deep trouble, as are the Italian banks. We Germans can shape the new emerging Europe for the next century. This will be a German century. Well, Kohl, being a power-hungry bastard, went for it. So the euro came into being, but it had a fatal flaw. It was a monetary union from top down with headquarters in Frankfurt called the European Central Bank. But there was no political union. There was no United States of Europe. There were individual sovereign states that were very, very loath to surrender their sovereignty, including Germany. So they papered over the flaw and said, well, we have the biggest economic space uh, almost rivaling the GDP of the United States if you add together all the Euro member countries. And most of our trade is internal, so we, uh, this thing is a winner every, every way you look at it. Well, around this time, Alan Greenspan is head of the Federal Reserve with his friends on Wall Street. Keep in mind, if you don't know this, that the Federal Reserve is not a government central bank. It's a privately owned central bank owned by Wall Street and the gods of money. And Greenspan, no central bank chairman, of the Fed is chosen without the consent of Wall Street privately. Greenspan came from J.P. Morgan and everything he did as chairman of the Fed in his, I believe it was 16 year tenure, was to the benefit of Wall Street at the expense of the national economy. And Greenspan pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and used the enormous authority he had from the Wall Street dominated media to get the government, to get Congress to pass laws that would free up the banks to do whatever they wanted without any governmental supervision, regulation. And that's when you had the merger of investment banks, Wall Street, commercial banks, and insurance companies to create gigantic financial institutions whose balance sheet was larger than the gross domestic product of most nations on earth. And they became so large that uh, the term was coined and pushed by Wall Street that they were too big to fail, TBTF. What does that mean? It means the banks, the banks of Wall Street, not most American banks, but the banks of Wall Street, could do whatever in hell they wanted to. And when the thing came crashing down, finally, the taxpayer would pick up the tab because we're too big to fail. Well, they bought all the 
key members of the House and Senate Banking Committee to make sure that nothing happened that was unwished by them. And they started the deregulation of controls on banking that were put into place during the Great Depression, the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, and various other controls, restraints on banking. They got laws passed that this was in 1999, 2000, they got laws passed that allowed financial trading, uh, trading in financial instruments, derivatives, currencies and so forth, derivative trade to be unsupervised by the Commodity Future Trading Corporation, the agency of the government with the responsibility to supervise financial derivative trade. So six largest banks in Wall Street grew to dominate world trade in these new financial instruments, futures, options, and so forth, that were called derivatives with no regulation. So they were able to control the price of gold, to control the price of silver on the world market, to control the price of oil by simply manipulating between the banks the price of these commodities. Well, then they got the idea in the early part of this century, the 2001-2002, with the connivance of Greenspan to create a financial revolution. And this financial revolution was called asset-backed securities. Bonds were issued not by corporations like General Motors or, or General Electric and so forth, or Ford Motor Company, corporate bonds. Bonds were issued that had no single corporation behind them. They were asset-backed securities backed by, usually by home mortgages that were bundled together geographically from across the United States. Maybe several hundred mortgages were put into a bundle and sold. Well, first of all, there were mortgages that were not high quality. People with no adequate credit means to buy a house way beyond their income they were given mortgage loans, sometimes for more than 100% the value of the house they wanted to buy. And the local banker would give him the mortgage and he would have a verbal discussion. Say, well, Mr. Smith, how much income do you have? How much do you earn a month? And Mr. Smith would lie and say, I earn $100,000 a year, da 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 okay, just sign this uh, mortgage and, and it's done. So he would sign the mortgage, of course. He thought, you know, this is my dream. I get a $100,000 house. I never dreamed of that in my life. These would be people without jobs in many cases. And the banks were so cynical, they called these liars loans. They knew the guy was lying. They didn't care. Why? Because under the new financial revolution of Wall Street, the gods of money, Wall Street bought those liars loans, those mortgages, from these local banks all around America at a discount so the, the local bank could continue the game and, and make nice profits on the whole thing. And then Wall Street would bundle these mortgages into new securities, bonds, asset-backed uh, bonds. Then because there were some dodgy loans in this, uh, they, they would mix it with good quality mortgages from good people with real money or real paper money, and then they would go to insurance companies that specialized in, in uh, uh, this kind of security, and they would get an a insurance policy, so if there's a default based on historical record of mortgage defaults, uh, there's a default on X percent of these mortgages, let's say 2 or 3 percent, the loss of mortgage payment would be covered by the insurance policy. And then they would go with this insurance on this bundle of bonds, and they'd go to Standard & Poor's or uh, uh, Moody's, the two giant rating agencies that uh, rate almost everything in the world for credit uh, value, credit worthiness, and they would get a AAA rating. Well, for Moody's, it was enormous. It was a money machine. It became their most lucrative source of, of income. So the entire structure of the U.S. financial system, with the blessing of the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, 
who to my mind is a criminal who ought to be behind bars and not uh, some man revered as a, a great guru of central bank uh, finance, they created this huge asset bubble. Real estate prices were going through the roof back in 2004, 2005. It became a Ponzi scheme. And the more the prices of homes began rising in America, the more people were feverish to go in. They had terms like flipping. You buy a house, one day put a coat of paint on it and flip it in, in one month and sell it for uh, double the price in some states like Florida and so forth. Well, this madness came to a screeching halt in summer of 2007 when a tiny, well not a tiny, but a small, largely unknown bank in Dusseldorf, Germany, the industry and, uh, let's see, industry credit Handelsbank, part of the state bank, uh, announced that it was having trouble meeting payments because they had bought billions of dollars of these mortgage loans from Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank was in on the game with the New York banks. And that started a snowball in the global financial system because modern banking since 1609, when the Bank of Amsterdam, a municipally owned bank in Holland, began something called fractional reserve banking, modern banking in the West has been based on one thing and one thing only, confidence. Now confidence is a psychological quantity. Are you confident that uh, the person driving this taxi is going to get you to the airport without crashing the car because he's dodging in and out of lanes and so forth at 100 miles an hour? Are you confident that this doctor is going to do what's best for your health or for your children's health? Well, modern banking, something happened to the Bank of Amsterdam. The merchants who kept their gold uh, on store with this Bank of Amsterdam, rather than truck it around you know, from city to city, they didn't know that the leaders of the Bank of Amsterdam, after decades of having this gold sitting there one to one, so that if all the merchants at any one day would demand their gold, the Bank of Amsterdam had the gold in the vault under City Hall. Well, they got the ingenious idea what would happen since nobody, very few people ever come to demand their gold unless they're in duress. How about if we lend out 5% of the gold for, for uh, interest, make a little more money? They tried that. It worked beautifully. Then they said, well, that worked fine. Let's try 10% because nobody has ever demanded 10% of uh, and then it's like the farmer who discovered an ingenious way to cut down his cost of grain when the price went up. He started feeding his prize horse a mixture of 95% grain, oats and so forth, and 5% sawdust from trees that he cut down. And that worked fine. The horse seemed to be healthy and so, well, let's up it to 10% sawdust and 90%. So his farmer neighbor said, gee, how did, how, how, and what happened then? He said, it worked beautifully until I fed it 100% sawdust and the horse died. Well, that's pretty much what happened with the Bank of Amsterdam. It had a run on the bank and they had no gold to satisfy the, uh, the depositors and they went under. And the power of the city of Amsterdam, which was the greatest financial power of, of the 17th century, shifted over to the city of London. City of London after World War I, the power shifted to New York. But the same fraudulent methods were used in every case, and that is fractional reserve banking. That is, the banks at any one time have only a allowed fraction on reserve if depositors demand their money. That's why you had bank panics during the Great Depression all across America before certain acts of the government were taken. Well. The dollar system that was created in Hiroshima in August 1945 is, if nothing else, a very impressive system technically because part and parcel of it is the most powerful banks in the world 
commodity trade of the world denominated in dollars and the control of the credit rating agencies that rate the credit of European banks, of Japanese banks, of Chinese banks. The Chinese have their own credit rating, but internationally the only recognized credit rating agencies are the U.S. credit rating agencies, which are incestuously tied to the banks of Wall Street, the gods of money. There was a study done recently at ETH, the uh, Technical University in Zurich, Switzerland, doing a computer analysis of corporate interlocks, directors and, and shareholdings, stock holdings, worldwide. And the conclusion they reached was that 147 corporations through a pyramid of cross-ownership, control directly and indirectly 60% of the wealth of the entire world, 147. And the overwhelming majority were US and British financial institutions, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, the Boston funds such as Fidelity, Magellan, and so forth and Barclays Bank and such institutions in the city of London. Well, if you want to know the source of so many of the problems in today's world, go back to the families who control this vast amount of wealth. This is the agenda of globalization. This is the agenda of the World Trade Organization, trade in financial services, to create the free flow of capital so that if a country such as the Asian Tigers did in the 1990s, if they started growing independently of the dollar without indebtedness, without the IMF, a monetary fund in Washington, able to control them through debt to uh, peonage, then George Soros and his hedge fund friends were given credit lines and insider intelligence by all accounts to lead attacks on the Asian Tiger economies. First Thailand, the Thai bot, then Indonesia, and ultimately to South Korea, which is a major OECD member economy. And in every case, the IMF was demanded by Washington that the monetary fund come in and reorganize the financial system of these tiger economies. So the tigers became pussycats. And the end of the Asia crisis, the capital started flowing out of Asia, out of the tiger economies, into Washington to buy U.S. Treasury bonds to build up a currency reserve in dollars against future attacks. And the attacks were engineered through the U.S. government, through intelligence services connected with the U.S. in the city of London. And that tamed the Asian tigers the stage then shifted to China and the emergence of China, but as long as China was dependent on capital inflows from the West, Washington had no worries about it. They used the cheap labor. American corporations made huge profits on the building up of China after 1979 until rather recently, and then they started getting a little bit angry. Well. What emerged during the 2007-2008 period with the financial crisis, suddenly Washington was running government deficits per year of a scale never imagined in human history, more than $1 trillion money given out minus money taken in and taxes a deficit annually of more than one trillion dollars so that by 2010 the government of China feeling its economic muscle more than before gave a public statement to the world saying that they were quite upset with the fiscal uh, lack of control of the US debt the government debt because China was the largest holder of U.S. Treasury bonds with their dollar trade surpluses. America was their largest trading partner. 
They sold Chinese goods to the United States, to Walmart and so forth. And they made a public statement that they planned to diversify out of the dollar. Well, the only candidate to put their reserves in was the euro. So the Chinese began building up their euro and di diminishing their dollar purchases. Suddenly, deus ex machina, a crisis broke out in a tiny, tiny country in the eastern part of the European Union with a long history, a long tradition, but an economy that uh, is not worthy of the name, the country called Greece. Well, Greece, it was discovered, had cheated to get into the euro in 2002 by hiding the state debt. To get into the euro, as some of you may know, you have Maastricht rules, rules that you have to have a no more than 3% uh, deficit in your state finances per year and no more than 60% uh, debt to GDP. Well, Greece was well over the 3%, but they concealed it through derivatives until it was announced by Papandreou, who had just been elected. Papandreou, whose family has a history going back decades with US intelligence and British intelligence. Papandreou announced that the nasty conservative government back in 2002 had done all these nefarious things to get into the euro and get the benefit of the low interest rates because the euro brought the interest rates down dramatically. Well, it turns out that the banks who advised the Greek government in 2002 was called Goldman Sachs, the advisor to the Greek government on its, on its debt management policies. Well, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase created the manipulations that allowed Greece to hide the reality until Papandreou exposed it to the world. Then the hedge funds went into action. George Soros had a meeting in New York with several of the top hedge funds. These are speculative funds with credit lines from the big banks. And they started attacking the Greek government debt, the euro. They said the euro, Greece, Greece can't stay in the euro with this kind of high percentage of government uh, debt, over 100% at that time. So the value of the bonds of the Greek government, each government in the Eurozone issues their, their own bonds at, at the present, the value collapsed uh, from these financial attacks. And then just as the European governments who, who were stunned, they didn't, one thing about the continental Europeans by and large, with the exception of a few banks like Deutsche Bank, they don't know how the Wall Street money game is played. They're, they're naive children in comparison to Wall Street and the city of London who've been doing this for quite some time. So they couldn't, couldn't imagine that such uh, uh, complicity would be behind the, the attack on the Greek uh, government bonds, government debt. So they met, finally they realized the crisis wasn't going to go away, and the heads of government in the Euroland agreed on a bailout package for Greece. Well, the day that they agreed on that, Standard & Poor's, one of the two giant credit rating agencies of New York, devalued the debt, the sovereign debt of Greece by three notches down to what is called in the trade junk bond ratings. And when a, when a government bond is rated junk, pension funds around the world who hold government bonds under certain rules and regulations are forced to immediately get rid of that paper. They're, they're, they're not allowed to hold that. So that started an entire new round of the Greek crisis. Then analysts began looking at other countries in the euro they said, hey, Ireland doesn't look uh, quite so good here. Well, then the Greek finance, uh, the Irish finance minister, excuse me, brought in a consultant from Wall Street, a company called Merrill Lynch, say, tell us what to do. You know, well, Merrill Lynch did a six page report for the Greek finance minister and they said, the pressure on the, on the Irish banks, allied Irish and, and Anglo-Irish and so forth, these large banks in Ireland, 
the pressure will abate if you make a statement that recreates confidence of the, the investors. Confidence is modern banking. It's a game of confidence, a con game. Well, the finance minister, whether he was venal or just stupid, did one of the stupidest things of any finance minister in history. He gave a press conference. Instead of saying, the government of Ireland stands behind all of the deposits in its banks, they said the government of Ireland stands behind all liabilities of its banks. So suddenly, a private banking crisis that could easily have been contained the way it was in Sweden in the early 90s, with the Securum and so forth, became a sovereign debt crisis. The debt of Ireland suddenly was out of control. So the same hedge fund started an attack on the Irish uh, state debt. So this euro crisis began spreading like a cancer. It spread to Portugal, it spread to Spain, where there'd been a blowout of the speculative real estate market directly tied to uh, English investors who had a real estate bubble there. And, well, England was outside the euro since 1992, so they weren't affected in quite the same way. But then there began to be stories in the Wall Street Journal and uh, uh, CNBC, the financial channels in New York and London, the Financial Times, about the Euroland crisis that the euro had to dissolve, that it just wasn't a viable entity. So the governments came in with trick after trick to try to prop this up. Well, nothing fundamentally has been changed. The banks, the money that's been promised to Greece didn't go to the Greek economy. The Greek economy has almost 50% unemployment by real measures. The youth unemployment, I believe, is, is 47 something percent. Uh, it's a catastrophe. Ireland people are emigrating out of Ireland like they did in the 1840s with the potato famine again. Uh, young people are leaving Portugal in droves, engineers, people with education, trying to get work anywhere they can, Brazil or other places. And the money that's gone through these government rescues from Germany and, and other countries has gone to guarantee the exposure in Greek bonds of the French banks, the German banks, and other banks. So again, who emerges out of this crisis are these banks that are deemed by the European governments as too big to fail. Well, the euro no longer was considered to be an alternative to the dollar as reserve currency, and the dollar, which appeared on the brink of a catastrophic collapse in 2010, suddenly was seen again as a safe haven. Now, we have two crises that are metastable, highly unstable. One is the euro crisis and the other is the dollar crisis. Well, not all currencies in the world can be simultaneously devalued because they're valued relative to each other in a floating system like we have. But the real economy in the United States has been hollowed out over the last 30 years with outsourcing, globalization, various other things. The alternatives at this point in history to this mismanagement or this turning over to criminal bankers is what they are, they're criminals, they're cheats, they're liars, they should be behind bars and not uh, in bars, <laughs> drinking uh, vodka martinis and so as they do today. I'm sure in New York. But we ask, what are the alternatives? Well, at this point, this is a political question, not a financial question. And finance is above all a political and a geopolitical question. This is something that's not taught in the academic curriculum of any university in the West that I know of. Uh, in a twisted way, some of the universities under the Soviet system and under China during the uh, more Marxist period taught certain theories of Karl Marx on surplus value and, and uh, primitive accumulation and so forth that kind of lead 
in a direction of understanding what, what the West is doing, the so-called capitalist system. But the political alternative that we have in the world today is what I sometimes call an iron triangle of resistance to this dollar globalization. And that is the political axis that's shaping up in Eurasia, the one part of this planet which has the population, the skilled, trained skilled level, every natural resource needed, and the know-how to be entirely independent of the dollar system and the euro system. And that is an axis if you draw a triangle between Beijing in China, Moscow in Russia, and Tehran in Iran. And this iron triangle encompasses the countries of Central Asia, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, rich in oil and gas resources, rich in minerals beyond belief. And these countries, since September 2001, have been increasingly cooperating under something called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a loose coming together annually of the countries of Central Asia, China, and Russia, with Iran as an observer, with India as an observer, such as the landmass, the geopolitical landmass of Eurasia is coming closer and closer together as a response to the insanity coming out of Washington and London and NATO. So the U.S. response to this has been manifold. One has been something called the Arab Spring by the mainstream media. It's no spring, it's a nightmare. But the revolts that have taken place in Tunisia, in Egypt, in uh, Syria with the terror war against uh, the Syrian government, really, uh, the aim of this by Washington and, and London is to install some or an organization, Islamic organization, backing the Islamic Sharia law, which is a pretty harsh law for a government to impose on its people, called the Muslim Brotherhood. And we had this in Egypt until the army stepped in, backed up by millions of Egyptians who were fed up with this religious uh, straitjacket that the Brotherhood was imposing through Morsi. So, but the aim of this, the intervention of NATO bombing Libya to the Stone Age, literally, was to break up the energy channels from the Middle East and North Africa into China primarily, into Central, uh, into Asia, and to be able to control that and keep countries like Egypt, Libya, and so forth from getting closer and closer especially to the Chinese who were all over Africa and the Middle East. China's biggest supplier of oil next to Saudi Arabia is Iran. Iran's biggest customer to export its oil is China. So at this point, with the economy of the U.S. rotting under its feet, the Pentagon is the last pillar of power that the elites of Wall Street and Washington, excuse me, have left to maintain American hegemony in the world. The goal of globalization and the, this entire process of uh, the euro crisis, the dollar crisis, the subprime real estate crisis, is to control the money of the world, directly or indirectly. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be one currency. It's de facto a euro dollar system right now uh, because the euro if it does anything uh, uh, untoward will be smashed again like it was with the Greek crisis. So the goal of this is what the Pentagon calls full spectrum dominance, total control of everything everywhere, land, sea, air, space, outer space, cyberspace, it all should come under control to create what one strategist in, in Washington called in a book he wrote years ago, universal fascism. Fascism in the sense of Mussolini's Italy, where private corporations control the trade unions, the labor force, they control the government, 
The government in Washington today is controlled by private corporations, the banks of Wall Street, the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned about when he left office in 1961. It's controlled by agribusiness, which is a strategic holding of these elites of Wall Street, the gods of money. Monsanto, Cargill, Archer Daniel Midland, the grain cartel, the agribusiness companies. And they want to bring the entire world under its thumb. I'll get into this on Sunday in my remarks about genetic manipulation and the geopolitical agenda behind that, so I won't elaborate. I want to conclude on a slightly different tack because I've had several conversations and I have this always in conferences where I speak. But what can I do? I'm only one person or a few friends that think the way I do who are enlightened or awake or whatever term you want to give it. What can I do as an individual? I, I feel hopeless, overwhelmed by, by knowing the power that these people have. Well, first of all, as, as Frank said in his opening remarks, to know what you're confronting is the first step. If you're walking blind, you're going to get killed one way or the other. If you're walking blind down an expressway with your eyes closed, sooner or later a car is going to hit you and put an end to your life. There are only fundamentally two things, two emotions. One is the emotion that these powerful, elite, bad people in these families manipulate, and that is the emotion of fear. And they try to create fear in every corner of our lives. Fear that our children will become sick if we don't give them vaccines, vaccines that make them sick with adjuvants in those vaccines. Uh, things like Gardasil for cervical cancer that are given to eight-year-old girls, and now they want to give it to boys as well, for, and one thing after the other. So they develop fear in every corner of our life, fear of unemployment, fear that our savings will be wiped out because there will be a, a market crash. And that fear imprisons us to be passive, paralyzed, and like the citizens of ancient Rome during the imperial days, we come to the Colosseum to watch the gladiators get devoured by the lions because unconsciously we're fascinated by the power of these emperors, these gods of money and so forth. So we become passive. We think we can do nothing. Well, there is an antidote to this, and it's the most powerful weapon that these elites are terrified of, and that is a four-letter word called love. The love, the unconditional love of a mother for a handicapped child who's born with a brain defect, call it mongoloid or whatever, or a physical defect, but that mother loves that child above any creature that uh, you can imagine. Well, this is a quality that we have largely pushed in the back as we are caught up in a consumer society. We're desensitized by one thing or another. Uh, and we become robotic in our human relations. I want to close with a, with a personal anecdote. And that is, three years ago, I met a doctor in Munich. I'm sitting... Uh, without full power in my legs since the end of my fourth year of life. And I met a doctor in Munich, Germany, Dr. Ulrich Randall. We've since become dear friends. And he was a fan of my book, A Century of War. I'd given out about 80 copies to friends and patients. He invited me to come to Munich, and he said, when he realized I was in a wheelchair, he said, I have a machine that I've invented that might help your legs. Uh, I'll give you free treatments and we can talk politics, which he loves to do. So I came there between Christmas and New Year's for a week with Ulrich. And then he said, William, you have nerve, you have feeling in both of your legs. I didn't realize this. Theoretically, you can reconnect your brain to the muscles, the, le the dormant muscles in your legs and build those up. And if you don't, 
the motto is use it or lose it. Well, that put the fear of God into me. And he said, I have a friend who runs a rehabilitation clinic, a neurological clinic in Bavaria. And he called the friend and said, I'm sending a, a patient of mine to you. And I came to the clinic, a big fight with my insurance company. They didn't want to pay a penny, but I went anyway. And the doctor in charge, the friend of Ulrich's, said, I'm going to give you, normally we give a physiotherapist for 30 minutes, three times a week. But I'm going to give you my best physiotherapist, her name is Helga, for one hour every day. And from the first session with Helga, we bonded on a human level. Uh, she just radiated, and she does radiate love as a human being. She had a, a da daughter, she has a daughter, who was born with a brain tumor that had to be operated. And since then, the child, who's now, I think, 16, isn't quite like the other children. She's, she's functional, but she's not quite like the other children. And I think Helga, in her own life, and she had gone through enormous personal difficulties, a husband who left her with 100,000 euros of debt on, on her inherited house that she built with her husband, left the country and left her indebted and she managed to do amazing things with her life. She had the idea to inspire me to do something with my legs, so we worked on the water therapy. And she had invented a special device. She kept it secret. She had dreams of patenting it, but I think she realized that it wouldn't make the kind of money that, she, that could bring her out of her financial distress. In any case, she said, I'd like to try this on you, William. I said, of course, I trust you totally, Helga. So the device enabled her with her feet to connect to my feet in the water. Water came up to here, and I had uh, these noodles, I don't know what you call them, you know, made out of styrofoam, under the arm, so I was stabilized. And then she held me at the waist and began walking around this therapeutic pool for one hour. And that was the first time since I got leg braces at age five or age six that I could move my legs in the way a normal person would bend, bend at the knees and, and feel the sensation of walking. And it, it felt wonderful. So two days later, we had our second session in the pool with these special shoes. And about a quarter of an hour into the walking, spontaneously, without thinking about it, I started moving my own legs, and Helga stopped cold. She said, William, wow, that's you, that's not me. And from that moment on, it changed my life. It gave me an energy for living that I hadn't felt in a marriage that had stagnated beyond the point of repair. I made the decision to get out of that relationship and make my own way further because I couldn't do it with the angst that my then wife uh, had about what I was doing. She was afraid I literally would walk away from her. And that energy came because Helga transmitted to me the feeling of unconditional love. You can do this, William, you can do this. And I resonated with that energy and it gave me such strength that literally I could move mountains and I, I've been working on that ever since. So. This is a very personal example, but I want to give you a sense, every one of you, that you can move mountains if you go inside yourself, you take responsibility for yourselves, for your lives, because that's what all of us, myself included, tend so easily to give up. Usually in our childhood, we suffer humiliation from parents, from whatever, in school, uh, one way or another. So we feel it doesn't, you can't get out of the trap. You're, you, you have to just kind of play the game and behave and so forth. Well, this is one way you can get out of this, to build on this with trust in each other based on love, based on unconditional love, conditional love, whatever, but not possessive, destructive love. So I close by saying that, giving the example of one person was a mother, I believe, in the state of Utah, and mother with children, 
and she followed the referendum in California, I forget, the 37 was it, on, on labeling of food as containing genetically modified organisms. Well, when she read that Monsanto had spent something like $8 million to block this referendum in California, and the referendum didn't pass, there was some question about whether the votes were correctly counted or not, I don't know. But she got so upset about this, sitting there in Utah, she had the idea to create a Facebook with the title, March Against Monsanto, and declared a certain day in May, I forget the day I was invited to speak in Frankfurt, she put this out on Facebook and it went viral. Suddenly Monsanto couldn't buy off Greenpeace or any of the usual NGOs that they were used to buying off and silence them, blunt their sword, because this was coming spontaneously. I think it was 52 cities or f around the world, several million people turned out to these demonstrations against Monsanto. Suddenly, it became popular in the media and elsewhere to focus on Monsanto as this bad, bad, bad corporation. And since that time, Monsanto has been on the defensive totally worldwide. That's just one example. It's, it's by no means uh, reversed the march of these pathological madmen who uh, are trying to destroy 90% of the human race, if we believe Ted Turner, uh, because they think there are too many useless eaters like us. I happen to disagree with that, by the way. So the idea that we're helpless, that the world is overwhelming and so forth, is a question of energy. And the energy of love, true love, not possessive love, not destructive love, but true love, as human beings, as family, as friends, and so forth, as partners, that energy trumps anything that these elites can do with chemtrails, with psychoterror, with this, that, and the other thing. So with that, I thank you and I end my remarks. Before I just ask, I, I have a question too, uh, because um, I'm also very interested in the economy, like some of you know from last year. And I uh, have a focus on this Glass-Steagall thing, which will split investment bank and commercial banks. Uh, I would like to hear your comment if Glass-Steagall is a possibility to take power away from the banks and give, the, give it back to, to, the, to the government. Well, the, the problem with legislation in the U.S. today is that the United States of America since 9-11 has been stepwise turning into a police state that's comparable to what Germany was in the early 1930s. And I'm deeply sad to say that as an American, but there's no other conclusion. Uh, so to have a simple repeal of Glass-Steagall, I don't think would do much about the problem. What I advocated in, in my articles at the time of the 0708 crisis was that the banks, the six offending banks of Wall Street, the gods of money banks, should be nationalized, should be broken up, the dodgy toxic waste, as they call it in Wall Street, the worthless paper that was sitting in these banks from liars' loans and other things. That should be isolated like they did in Sweden with Securum and sorted out over time. And then the smaller banks would do traditional banking. There should be a repeal of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 that the Congress takes back the power to print and coin money that was given to it under the Constitution and not give it to private banks through the Federal Reserve, and a number of things like that. But these are all political questions. And as long as congressmen are corrupted by the power of money, by the power of Wall Street, campaign contributions, various other forms of corruption, then I don't see a prospect of that legislation 
So it's, it's a question of political mobilization of the population. Right now, Americans here in the room who have a more direct contact with this should correct me if, if I'm wrong in my estimation, but the population is in a state of, of passivity or when they're active, they get caught up into fake movements like the Tea Party, who maybe had originally genuine beginnings or uh, Occupy Wall Street, which may have had a kernel of well-meaning people in it, but it was rapidly taken over by Obama's front men to build a democratic mass alternative to the Tea Party uh, and became a dead-end movement that did more to discredit opposition to the banks than to build it. So uh, I don't think Glass-Steagall alone is going to solve this problem. It's much, much bigger. Thanks for your talk, William. That was really excellent. My question is, um, there was a, an award-winning NPR series called This American Life that covered the financial crisis in 2008 when it was happening. And they said that the pool of money that fed the housing bubble was Chinese middle-class investment money based on their own economic growth that was taken and invested into American real estate, commercial and real estate, uh, commercial and residential real estate. My question to you is, if that is the case, can you explain a little bit what is the direct relationship between Chinese investment and American properties, and what does that portend for the United States in the future uh, if we have a huge wave of defaults or if the Chinese own all of this American paper? What's going to happen in the future? Uh, I'm rather dubious about the NPR uh, uh, story on, on the Chinese creating the real estate bubble. I, do, I don't think that was the case. There may have been some Chinese money coming into the bubble from Hong Kong, from Shanghai, from whatever. Yeah, I don't think that was at all the primary driver of this. Uh, and there, there are reports that the Chinese are buying up all the land in America to create shale gas. That also isn't quite the reality. Chinese are desperate to get oil and gas, and they want to learn from the Americans how to get gas from shale rock, which is a horrible technology, environmentally destructive. It ruins the water, it creates earthquakes, which the Chinese don't need more of. Uh, and they have water problems too. So. Chesapeake Energy and some of the big U.S. players in the shale gas market when the gas price collapsed were suddenly on the verge of insolvency and they looked for suckers to buy their acreage to get out of their debt. And the Chinese were there with the big checkbook. So they did buy some properties from these U.S. energy companies. But I, I think it's quite the Chinese, the middle class Chinese, back in 2005, 2006 and 2007 were just coming into a middle-class economic status. Uh, I've been to China, I think, nine times now since 2008, and I've actually witnessed this over the five-year period. Uh, they're just coming into the middle-class income status where they can buy a car for the first time in history, where they can buy an apartment, own an apartment. So the Chinese money has been going in internally to Chinese consumption. And very little of it, uh, I think, has is, is certainly not created or been responsible for the real estate bubble. The Fed under Greenspan and the Wall Street banks are the primary culprit and uh, asset-backed securities, mortgage-backed securities, in my view. I think we... Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think we can make everybody happy. Um, but... Uh, Yes, uh, you know, William will be here the whole conference, and if you have some questions, I'm sure when William just have a, a l got a little bit energy back, he will uh, surely answer them for you. But we, we take a last... Okay. Any okay. I think uh, nobody have more questions, so thank you very much, William. It was a pleasure.